Okay, today's lesson is our fourth lesson about medical physics. And whereas the first three lessons have been about x-rays, we're now going to uh, turn our attention to a different uh, uh, type of uh, scanning technique today. Uh, we're gonna have a look at something called a tracer and its um, imaging machine, which is called the gamma camera. And then this will lead us on to something you might have heard of, which is called a PET scan. Uh, so park what you know about x-rays, uh, and this is fresh. Okay, so uh, today's lesson is actually covered by two uh, parts of the textbook. So the first part is 27.4, and then we'll get on to 27.5 later on. Okay, so this should be familiar to you from GCSE, where we did mention radioactive tracers when we were doing uh, the radioactive, radioactivity topic there. So at A level, we just need to layer a little bit more detail onto what you already know. Uh, I will go through some detail now, and then there is a little bit more that's in the textbook that you can make notes on later, but it, it, it's, it's um, not that much more in the textbook. Okay, so, uh, a tracer is what we refer to. Uh, we refer to any um, material that we place inside the human body that then flows around the human body to a site of particular interest, where it emits uh, radioactive uh, radiation from decay, and we detect the radiation that's coming out of the body at the site of interest, and that allows us to non-invasively image the inside of the human body. At A level, you just need to be aware that we can target very, very specific biologies inside the human body. So any of you that are studying A level biology will know lots of examples of particular um, chemical reactions or particular uh, the pathways, particular processes that occur within uh, cells uh, in which uh, specific um, chemicals are undergoing chemical re reactions, often to produce things like proteins uh, and, and keep the life processes going within the cell. And once those biological pathways are understood, we can then look at the chemicals that are used in particular cells. Um, so for instance, a, a really, really common chemical to target is glucose because glucose is metabolized inside all cells and the rate of metabolism can be indicative of what the cells are doing. So um, you don't need to know about any of the biology for your physics exam, but if you are an A-level biology student, try to make the links between what you've learned about pathways in biology and what I'm talking about now. Okay, so once you've identified uh, that a particular material is required by some cells inside the body, what we would then try to do is to modify it. So what we would do is, for instance, in carbon, uh, in sorry, in glucose, we would look at the fact that glucose contains carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, and we would look at some chemical process in which maybe we could replace one of the carbon atoms or one of the oxygen atoms with a radioactive atom that will release radiation that we can detect, but replacing the uh, the stable atom with a radioactive atom doesn't alter the chemistry that that um, material is about to take place in. This is often called labeling. So we would inject uh, the patient with uh, a radioactive substance that contains a label. One of the atoms has been replaced by a radioactive emitter and we will try to uh, trace that radiation as the emitter flows through the body. We focus on um, radioactive particles that are gamma emitters. You will remember that alpha and beta are more dangerous than gamma. Uh, gamma is less ionizing, and this is better for the patient, but it's also for, better for the scan because the less ionizing the radiation is, the more likely it is to leave the patient and 
therefore be able to be detected. Certainly, if we were to place an alpha emitter inside the patient, that would be bad for the patient because alpha radiation is very, very ionizing, and it would be useless in terms of the scan because alpha radiation is so ionizing that it can't um, exit the body. Um, because it can't exit the body, it can't be detected by the detector. Um, the device that detects gamma emissions is called a gamma camera. Um, and we will get onto that in three or four slides time. Okay, so you should be aware of the name of the most common radioactive tracer that is used today. So um, we use a material called technetium-99, but we use a particular type of technetium-99. Um, we use uh, a version of it that is the decay product of another radioactive element. And when the technetium-99 daughter is produced in the decay, it is produced in a high energy, uh, unstable state known as a metastable state. So it is technetium-99, but because it's about to decay while remaining technetium-99, we put a little M on the end of it to just remind ourselves that it is technetium-99, but it's a version of that nucleus that is in a highly energetic metastable state. So the technetium 99M will decay into technetium 99 by dumping some energy. It's going to release a gamma ray. It is uh, very, very commonly used throughout the world. In the UK, uh, there are about 20 million procedures every year. Um, so you should know, or you should deduce from that, that it isn't toxic to patients, that this has been injected many, many, many times uh, without side effects um, or without serious side effects, and therefore um, it's trusted and it's commonly used. You should also know a little bit about it in terms of the physics. So we've deliberately picked a material that as well as being non-toxic and as well as being a gamma emitter, also has a short half-life. So we would quite like it if the radiation that the patient was exposed to was limited to as long as necessary to perform the scan, but no longer than that. And therefore, if you uh, think about the processes involved in, in just transfers around a hospital, the logistics of it, sitting on chairs, waiting for your turn in the queue, a few hours is an appropriate amount of time for the patient to be um, keeping radioactive, obviously getting less and less radioactive every minute, but after about six hours, about half of that radiation has gone for technetium-99, and that's around about taking it down to a limit where we can't really detect it very much anymore, because uh, we didn't inject that much in the first place, and therefore uh, that gives us a six-hour window or so in order for the scan to be performed, uh, but it also means that the patient isn't uh, radioactive for days and days and days because even though gamma isn't as um, ionizing as alpha and beta, it still is ionizing and the patient is receiving damage from the interaction with the gamma rays. And so it's, it's appropriate ethically to make sure that the patient isn't radioactive for very long. The technetium 99M is going to um, decay at some point during those six hours and six hours obviously isn't very long. So not very long for it to be in the patient, but also not very long for it to be in the hospital to be injected into the patient in the first place. So um, we can't actually store technetium-99 ready for use, and it has to be produced when required. So what the hospitals do actually stock is a uh, the parent of the technetium-99, which is uh, the molybdenum 99 and that has a much longer half-life, but actually not that much longer. It, it, I think it's days, um, which means that you also need a facility nearby to produce the parent. Um, and that's actually a particle accelerator, not a huge big one like CERN has got, but a, a, still a room-sized particle accelerator. And there will be a, a, a small staff of particle physicists with a particle accelerator 
if not on site of the hospital, certainly in a facility nearby, just to produce the parent um, atoms that can then be transferred to the hospital so that the hospital on site can produce the technetium-99, um, literally as the patient requires it. So uh, it, there's a whole um, wing of physics staff that are employed in hospital radiography departments for a whole host of different technologies. And I guess this is as most physics-y as it's going to get, that you actually are operating a particle accelerator. Um, just as a note as well, we talked about um, safety with x-rays and the fact that the radiographer has to leave the room when the x-rays are being used, just so that they don't get repeated exposure themselves. Uh, similarly, you don't want to be the person who's injecting patients day after day after day with a radioactive substance because you are going to get some exposure yourself. So as the uh, syringe containing the Technetium-99 um, and, and all the other liquids that, that you get injected with, as that's transported around the hospital and injected into the patient, it's actually got a lead shield around it, which you can just see in the photograph there. Okay, so um, this guy has been injected with some technetium and he would like to share it with you. So have a little watch of this. Hey, so this is baseline radiation. Let's take a look. Something about 3.5 counts per second. Okay, that sounds like the background. And then <laughs> let's go look at Chris, who, had, who has go. some technetium 99 in him. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if, if that guy wanted to see that he was radioactive or not. Um, so they, they keep you in a, a separate part of the hospital and make you wee in a sealed toilet that doesn't leak your radioactive wee out into the rest of the drinking water eventually, um, the sewage system. So it's all handled um, with the level of security and safety considerations that you'd expect it to which can be a little bit frightening as a patient, I would imagine, but uh, it is still a small amount of radiation and it doesn't last for very long. And as we met with x-rays, although there is a small chance of cellular, cellular damage from the ionizing radiation, you would only be experiencing this treatment if there was already a suspicion of something more seriously wrong with you. And if that wasn't diagnosed and treated, your underlying condition would be far more serious to your long-term health than any temporary cellular damage that you undergo because of the scan itself. Okay, so the following two examples of use are not examinable. I just thought you should have some examples of use. So uh, it turns out that um, bone growth within the human body uh, actually lends itself very well to the absorption of technetium-99. And so uh, one of the things that it's particularly good at is imaging bone growth, which ordinarily wouldn't be an interesting thing to do, given that bones grow particularly slowly. But there are medical conditions in which bone growth is abnormal. So uh, here is an example. Uh, that's obviously a foot. Uh, the left-hand image is a CT scan, and overlaid on top of it in the right-hand image are the emissions caught by a gamma camera um, of the uh, radiation coming from the Technetium-99. Now, as you just saw in the video, the Technetium-99 will be emitting throughout the patient's body, but it will collect particularly in certain areas of the human body. And so certain areas of the human body will have an even higher elevated um, emission count. And that's what's showing up here. And the interpretation of this picture is that the patient has um, extra abnormal bone growth, uh, or at least fibrous tissue growth going on between the bones of the feet, 
in a, a medical condition called collision where um, the bones fuse a little bit either because of bone growth or, or fibrous tissue growth between the bones. Um, another example, uh, the whiter image on the left hand side is uh, a full body gamma scan with a gamma camera and you can see that there is elevated emissions coming from the abdomen area. So uh, then the patient has undergo undergone a CT scan at the same time. Those are the pictures on the right hand side, E, F and G. And then a computer has overlaid the gamma emissions onto the CT scan so that there is um, a, a map basically of where the gamma emissions are coming from. And in actual fact, the diagnosis in this case uh, is of ovarian cancer uh, with the increased emissions coming from the tumorous cells. It is quite normal actually in both or this scan, the, the gamma camera scans and the PET scans that we'll come on to in a minute, it is quite normal to run them uh, simultaneously with a CT scan so that the, um, the tracer in the PET scan is kind of picking up what, what would be called uh, a functional scan. It, it's watching processes occur within the body. In this case, um, the processes occurring within the tumor cells um, against the CT scan, which isn't being used to pick up any functional processes occurring within the body, it's just mapping the body. And quite often the two scans are used at the same time to map the, the functional scan on top of the, the more passive scan behind. Okay, we better learn what a gamma camera is then. So this is the device that's catching the gamma rays. Now you just saw uh, a handheld gamma detector, which is a, a Geiger Muller tube or a, a Geiger counter. And you should be familiar with those from GCSE and we will study them again when we do radioactivity. Um, but they're, they're kind of a blunt tool. They just detect the existence of radiation. They're not particularly directional and they're not particularly very good at locating the emission over a particular area. So we need a better device than that. So this is a schematic of something called a gamma camera. The yellowy object at the bottom <laughs> is a, a kind of cross section of a bit of pa patient. And the pinky object in the middle of it is the organ that is being um, imaged. So the patient has been injected with some kind of tracer, probably technetium, but other tracers exist. And the organ has absorbed some of that tracer um, and is now the site of increased gamma emissions within the patient's body. And each one of those purpley arrows is representing the path of a gamma photon as it leaves the patient's body. And you can see that many, many, many photons go nowhere near the gamma camera, but some of the photons are heading upwards towards it. And what we want to do is be able to image exactly where on the patient the photon came from. So the thing that's labeled array of photomultiplier tubes, those are gonna be the pixels. That's gonna give us the resolution of the image. So each one of those little black rectangles on the end of the photomultiplier tube, that's what you need to think of as your pixels. So you might know from last time you bought a mobile phone, you know, digital cameras have a certain number of megapixels associated with them. And what that means is that you break an image down into dots. Um, so your phone screen and your, your TV screen, they're made of little dots called pixels. And the more pixels you have, the higher the resolution. So on a display, the more pixels you have, the finer the um, display can display fine details. So that's the whole thing about high definition and ultra high definition. And then, the same process works for a camera. You need the aperture of the camera to let all that light in, but then behind the aperture of the camera, you need a lot of um, individual points of detection so that you can pick up um, light from different places and be able to tell that it's from different places. So we would ideally like as many photomultiplier tubes as we can. Um, 
But then we need to make sure that the gamma rays that are detected by each photomultiplier tube came from a place vertically below the tube and didn't pick up a gamma ray that was traveling diagonally from a different place. So you can see that at the bottom of the picture, we have a device called a collimator. And what you want to be thinking of as a collimator is if you were to get a very large number of drinking straws, which are long, long, thin tubes, and you were to hold them in your fist so that they all run parallel to each other, that's basically the idea of the collimator. They're very long and very thin. And what this means is that only a gamma ray that is traveling practically parallel to the, the tube-like structures, vertically in this picture, parallel to the collimator, only those photons can make it from one end of the collimator to the other. Any photons that are traveling at a slight angle will collide with the wall of one of the tubes of the collimator and won't make it to the, uh, the detectors at the other end. So that's a, a, a physical structure. Um, just a, a, a very large number of vertical thin tubes that only allow the photons that are vertically below the top end of the tube to get through to the top end of the tube. And then you have to ask, well, how do you actually detect a gamma photon? And then you remember that gamma photons are actually quite energetic and they are likely to damage electronics if you try to image a gamma ray photon. So what we would ideally like to do is borrow the technologies from visible light cameras, which are obviously um, a, a, a consumer, um, a, a bulk consumer item that have been mass produced and honed to a very high precision using consumer technologies like phones and um, laptop cameras and things like that. So we already have a, an existing set of highly sensitive um, devices that can capture visible light photons. So what we actually do is make the gamma ray photon hit a chemical that is called a scintillator. And what the scintillator does is it takes the energy from the gamma ray photon and effectively uses it to promote electrons into higher energy states. And then as the electrons decay down into lower energy states again, they tend to do that by emitting a series of visible light photons. And so the scintillator is a, a chemical device that transforms gamma ray photons into a large number of visible light photons instead. Again, those visible light photons are likely to come out traveling in all different directions. So we need the equivalent of a second collimator just above the scintillator. Um, but that can be much, much smaller um, and often uses um, fiber optic cabling. And that's called a light guide. Not, don't worry too much about the light guide. Eventually, however, the, uh, the visible light photon now will arrive inside what's called a photomultiplier tube. Um, and this is the crux of how individual photons are detected. And again, you should ask yourself at this moment, how did you think the camera on the front, uh, on the front of your phone actually works? When the light hits the camera, presumably an electrical signal comes out the other side to be um, processed by the chip in your camera. But exactly how does a camera turn a photon of light into an electrical signal. Well, the device that does that is called a photomultiplier tube. OK, so let's have a look at how one of these works. So here's a, a schematic of a photomultiplier tube on its side, the windows at the left hand side. And effectively, they work by the photoelectric effect. So a single photon is going to come in. It's going to strike a metal plate. And it's going to uh, remember the one to oneness of the photoelectric effect the photon is going to release a single electron. Now, single electrons can't be detected. We don't have tools that are that um, sensitive. So what we need to do is to try and get a cascade running so that we get one electron becoming more and more and more electrons. So what we do now is to place a large positive um, region nearby that will attract the electron. And as it attracts this 
this newly freed electron, the electron will pick up kinetic energy and we make it slam into a target a little bit like with the X-ray production. And as the electron slams into the target, it produces uh, some more electrons, usually about four or so. And then we repeat the process with an even more positive place nearby that will attract those four electrons across. And each of those four electrons will accelerate as they pass. And when they slam into the target, each one of those will release about four electrons. So now we're up to 15 to 20 electrons on their travels. And we just repeat and we repeat and we repeat. And bit by bit by bit, as the electrons um, accelerate their way through with these uh, collisions with the positive plates each time, with an ever more positive plate nearby to attract the freed electrons. And by the time the electrons reach the final plate, which might have covered a whole kilovolt in terms of potential difference, um, we might have around about a million electrons. Now, a million electrons is still a very small number of electrons. Um, if you remember that in an electric current, you might have something like 10 to the 18, 10 to the 19 electrons flowing per second for a single amp or so. So 10 to the 6 is nowhere near 10 to the, 9, 10 to the 18, 10 to the 19, but it is finally detectable um, using uh, semiconductor electronics. And so we'll just get a little blip, a little pulse uh, that is detected, and that's good enough for uh, some circuits to count that as one photon arrived. And then the entire photomultiplier is reset and ready to go again, um, ready to detect the next photons. And, and this is on a, a, a nanosecond kind of um, time frame, so that it can detect uh, photons in real time, uh, so that if the um, picture is changing, then the detector would be able to notice the changes in real time. Much like with CT scans, this has only been possible since computer technology and electronics has been able to cope with the sheer volume of data that is arriving and be able to process it in time. Okay, so that's traces and the gamma camera, and all of that was contained in chapter 27.4. But then there's a very, very short chapter that follows next, which is only a couple of pages long, which just extends this into something called uh, PET scanning, or positron emission tomography. So there's that word again, tomography, which is to create an image through slices. So it works very similarly to CT scans, but whereas uh, CT scans were making their slices using X-rays, uh, what a PET scanner does is make its slices using gamma rays and gamma cameras. So just like CT extended X-rays, a PET scan is an extension of uh, tracer technology and gamma cameras. However, there is a crucial difference. Uh, and it is a crucial difference. So technetium-99, as we just saw, is a radioactive material that emits a single gamma ray photon. And so when detected in the detector, you only detect a single gamma ray photon. So you know it came from vertically below the uh, photomultiplier tube because of the collimator, but you actually don't know at what depth below the photo photomultiplier it came from. So you effectively flatten the patient into a two-dimensional version of themselves. Then if you remember the kid's story, Flat Stanley, where, where Stanley gets flattened into a thin little piece of paper of himself. So when the patient is placed underneath the gamma camera, you can see where two-dimensionally the radiation was coming from but not three-dimensionally. You can't tell at what depth through the uh, from the patient the, uh, the radiation is occurring, which is often a real hindrance. So uh, what we're going to do with PET scanning is add, some three third, uh, add a third dimension to it. Um, and in order to add a third dimension, again, coming back to this concept of binocular vision, you need to detect two photons, not one. You need to be able to trace them back to where they came from at the same time. 
So technetium's not gonna help us with this. It always emits a single gamma ray photon. What we need instead is something that emits two photons. Well, it turns out that radioactivity can't help us with this in terms of gamma decay, but beta plus decay can. So we've met beta plus decay before, the conversion of uh, a proton into a neutron. And we understand now that when this occurs, uh, some positive electric charge is released uh, via a positron, uh, an anti-electron. So we can't detect um, positrons. They're not going to make it out of the body. But the positron will interact with an electron inside the body. And when it does that, the two will annihilate to produce gamma photons that can be detected by our gamma camera. So let's go through this. Uh, first of all, there's an example there or two. So um, examples of materials that beta plus decay. So uh, one example of a beta plus decaying radioactive isotope is fluorine 18. And it turns out that uh, if you swap an oxygen atom for a glucose atom, uh, for a fluorine atom inside a glucose molecule, Chemically, it behaves very similarly. And the body will uh, transport the glucose, just like a regular glucose molecule. And it will even take it into the cell and begin metabolizing with it. Happily, fluorine decays into oxygen. And so long term, the glucose becomes glucose again, the, the, the radioactively labeled glucose. Um, but for a small moment while it travels through the body, it's actually not really glucose. It's, it's a glucose molecule that's had uh, one of its oxygens swapped for fluorine. Another possibility, uh, there are lots and lots and lots of carbon-based molecules that are used in various metabolic pathways within the human body. Um, any of those carbon-based molecules can be turned into a beta plus emitter by swapping out one of the carbon-12 atoms for a carbon-11 atom instead. Carbon-11 is also a, uh, a beta-plus uh, decaying molecule uh, atom. You don't need to worry about the chemistry of how we manage to replace an oxygen atom with a fluorine atom, or how we manage to swap a carbon-12 atom for a carbon-11 atom. For your physics A-level, that's not important, or although by all means, please do have a look if you're interested. You just need to be aware of the fact that we can send chemicals into the body that are beta plus decayers. And as I was just saying, the positron will uh, be emitted when the decay occurs, and the positron won't get very far before it encounters one of the body's own uh, electrons, and the positron and the electron will annihilate and by E equals mc squared, the mass of both will be converted into energy, and that energy will manifest as uh, gamma ray photons. And again, we haven't gone into it, I've mentioned this before, in order to conserve momentum, um, it is necessary for two gamma ray photons to be produced. Again, if you're interested in that, please feel free to um, do some Googling and, and find out more, but as far as your A-level is concerned, you don't need to worry about why two gamma ray photons are produced. Just fix in your mind that it has something to do with conservation of momentum. What is um, useful about the fact that the two photons are produced, though, is that when they're produced, they head off in opposite directions. And therefore, if we can detect both of them at the same time, we can trace back the lines um, through the collimators from two gamma ray um, cameras, and we can trace the two lines back to see where those two uh, lines uh, meet. And then even more accurately, what we can do is detect the minute difference in time between the arrival times of the two photons in the gamma detectors. And what this means is that we can tell that one path is slightly longer than the other one. And that also gives us um, an extra bit of accuracy in locating where the two came from. So a little bit like a, a CT scanner, 
Uh, PET scanners have detectors that rotate around the patient. And also like CT, uh, the patient is moved through the ring of detectors. And so um, we start imaging the patient slice by slice again, as, as the tomography uh, in the T uh, suggests. And what we obtain now is not just a two-dimensional image of the patient, but a three-dimensional image of the patient. Okay, here is uh, an example of how that can be used. These are actually um, two-dimensional pictures, aren't they, in front of you? Um, but I'm sure that when the, um, the doctors were using these scans, they would have been rotating them on screen to get a three-dimensional view. Okay, so this is a false color image. A computer has coded in red the areas where more radiation is coming from. Um, the whole patient will be emitting radiation, but there is extra radiation coming from the red areas. So um, in this particular case, uh, it's examining uh, the meta metabolism of glucose by using one of these uh, radioactive fluorine atoms. And you can see that the brain is lighting up because the brain metabolizes a lot of glucose all of the time. But you can also see on the scan where the white arrows are pointing uh, circled in blue, that there are certain areas of the patient that are lighting up as uh, metabolizing abnormally more than usual. Uh, and then the grayness of the image is a CT scan that's, that's uh, these gamma camera images have been overlaid on top of. And so a doctor has been able to identify that these red areas uh, correspond with the location of lymph nodes within the patient. And then also the one on the right hand side, a little higher up, just cupping around the stomach. Uh, that's your spleen. If you didn't know where your spleen was, it, it kind of just around your left hand side of your stomach, um, just under your rib cage or beneath your rib cage. Um, and the diagnosis in this particular case uh, was that these are likely to be infected lymph, node, lymph nodes and an infle infected spleen. And so um, the website that I took the image from said that biopsies were performed. That means uh, a small piece of tissue was removed from these sites. And it was diagnosed that uh, all of these sites had a bacterial infection and the patient uh, was prescribed a pretty complicated actually when I was reading the website course of drug treatment uh, in an attempt to clear up this pretty invasive bacterial infection that they had. I suppose uh, the, the, the difference between the x-ray technologies and the tracer technologies on, on one hand is really just you know with the x-ray technologies we shine x-rays through the patient. So they begin external to the patient, they shine through the patient, and some of them come out the other side. Whereas with the tracer scans, as we spoke about with x-rays, gamma rays and x-rays have very similar frequencies. Um, so the, the radiation is very, very similar. But with the tracers and the gamma camera, the radiation begins inside the patient and comes out rather than shining through the patient from the outside. In both cases as well, uh, it's possible to use um, a higher resolution version of it. So x-rays became uh, CT scans and the tracer and gamma camera have become the PET scan. And both of them can image uh, in 3D going through the patient slice by slice. I guess one big difference between the two technologies is that x-rays and CT scans tend to, but not entirely, tend to image um, passively in that they, the, they don't capture changes within the body, um, whereas the tracer technology and the and, tends to focus on um, metabolic pathways and so tends to focus on processes that are occurring in real time within the patient. Um, and so you get this element of what's called functional 
uh, scanning, where you can see a process actually taking place within, within the patient. And certainly if you were to place the patient inside the scanner immediately that they were injected, you would see um, the redness arriving on these images as it, the patient goes from being non-radioactive to radioactivity and emissions arriving from certain areas of the body, you would see uh, real-time changes occurring with the tracers and the gamma camera and the PET scanning.